Hello everybody, I would like to now go over the last few pages of your unit one review guide. So let's get started. Um, number five says define glucose. Glucose is a carbon containing sugar and it's created during photosynthesis. What can the glucose then be turned into and describe how it's used and why it's important to an ecosystem? The glucose can be used immediately for energy production, um, which is ATP. And this is important uh, for energy and carbon cycling because CO2 is a product of respiration. And so the glucose is going to be broken down and being used to make ATP, which is gonna allow the cell to function. Another thing that glucose can be used for is cellulose, which forms the cell walls, which are made out of glucose. It's like long chains of them. And trees sequester so much carbon from the atmosphere that as trees grow, their cells divide and they get more cells. These cells all have cell walls made out of cellulose. As such, more carbon is locked into the cellulose in the tree, allowing it to store more carbon. Uh, when a trees live for a long time, this is important for relatively long-term storage of carbon, which keep it out of the atmosphere. So the bigger a plant gets, the more cellulose it has and starch. Uh, this is energy storage for the plant. It's made out of glucose. It's a form of glucose that's eaten by animals that eat plants with that. And it's really important for energy cycling because this is how the glucose is going to be transferred to the organisms that consume it. So during the process of photosynthesis, glucose is created and the glucose can then be assembled to make starch. Okay, so starch is this long chain of a bunch of glucoses attached together. So let me show you a picture of that. Okay, I'm gonna add that in. Okay, so notice that we have glucoses attached together to form this long chain, which is starch. So when the plant has excess glucose and it's not using it immediately for cellular respiration, it can use it for a longer term storage. Another way that plants use glucose is to make up their cell walls. So if you take a look at this picture, you'll notice that the cells have um, a wall that surrounds the outside of it. And these cell walls are made up of these cellulose chains, which again are those glucose molecules just chained up together. So when a plant makes its own glucose, it can use it for starch, which is that long-term storage, or it can use it for cellulose, which make up the cell walls for that plant but a lot of the glucose will be used by the plant for doing basic cellular respiration, where we're gonna have that process, which is go cowie. And we're gonna have the glucose and oxygen going into the equation and then cowie going out of the equation. So we have CO2, we have water, which I don't see in this picture, okay, H2O and then ATP, which is the energy, okay? So a lot of the glucose will be used for a basic plant respiration process. Because remember, by the time the organism that consumes the plant, only 10% of the energy is gonna be able to be passed on to that organism that consumes it. So how is glucose important to carbon cycling? It's important to carbon cycling as it contains carbon. Photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and locks it away into the biosphere as it is used to create cellulose. Glucose is also broken down for energy, which is a process which releases the carbon back into the atmosphere. So as I mentioned, um, the CO2 is going out of the air during photosynthesis, being in this high energy glucose molecule, which then could be used to help create ATPs, which is the usable energy for the cell, or it could be used for storage in the form of starch or for the cell walls, which is cellulose. And how is glucose important to energy cycling? Glucose is important for energy cycling as it can be used for the energy, and it's important for animals to eat or for plants to use to grow or store a starch, which is that energy reserve. So if you eat a carrot, you are actually eating the starch reserves which are made up of long chains of glucose. And the energy is cycling from that carrot or being transferred from that carrot into you.
So again, when we think of a food chain, we want to think of how the energy is going from the carrot into that human. Now, a lot of the energy that was initially in the carrot gets lost as heat. Okay. Question number six, what is a calorie? A calorie is a unit of energy which can be defined as the amount of heat it takes to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. And that's just a definition. Um, if one object has 80 calories and another has 300, which has more energy? Well, if you're looking at a nutrition label, you would think the greater the number is, the greater amount of energy that's in there. So that's, since these are units of energy, 300 is a bigger unit of energy than 80. So what is the difference between a calorie and a kilocalorie? A calorie with a capital letter C is a food calorie, like what we see on nutrition labels, is a kilocalorie. So there are 1,000 calories, little lowercase c's, in one kilocalorie. So when they say you should have 2,000 calories a day, they really could say you should have 2,000 times 1,000 little calories that day. So it's a lot more beneficial to just use a smaller number um, and do 2,000 versus Versus if you do 2,000 times 1,000, we're talking about 2 million little C calories. So when we use the capital letter C that we see on, on a nutrition label, we're referring to um, kilocalories. So how could you test for how many calories there are in an object? Well, there's a test that you could do where you burn the food. Um, when you burn the food, the energy that is stored within that food will be burned off, releasing out heat which is a type of energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, so it had to have come from that initial food source. So the, the more that the food, the more heat that's released, the more energy that was in that food. And what is the relationship between calories and energy cycling? Calories are a measure of energy. Um, energy cycling shows how this energy can move through an ecosystem. Question number seven, what is a food chain and what can it be used for? Well, a food chain is a series of steps in which organisms transfer energy by eating and being eaten. Um, so here's an example, the grass, the energy is going to the mouse and the mouse, the energy is going to the hawk. It's helpful for looking at organisms that only eat one organism or are only being eaten by one organism. It's a very efficient one way chain, like a necklace chain. This is also helpful to look at like a specific interaction to see how one organism directly affects the other. But what's even better than a food chain typically is when we use a whole entire food web, which is question number eight, because it shows the full network of their feeding relationships. So we're seeing the entire ecosystem with all of the different relationships because typically organisms don't just eat one source of food, they might eat a few and they may have a few different predators that can consume them. So it gives you a more detailed uh, picture of what that ecosystem is like. So here we have a food web and it says, label the arrows on the food web with a plus or minus to show a positive or negative impact on the population of the organisms. Um, negative due to population reduction due to eating you're going to have mice, rabbits, and grasshoppers on the grass impacting the grass. Uh, fox will have a negative impact on the rabbits and mice because that's what they eat. Hawks will have a negative impact on your numbers of rabbits, mice, and snakes. Owls, since they consume mice and frogs, will have a negative impact on that population. Frogs will have a negative impact on the grasshopper population. Birds will have a negative impact on the grasshoppers and snakes will have a negative impact on the birds and frogs because they also eat frogs. All right, uh, positive due to providing food. Um, the grass is going to have a positive impact on the mice, rabbits, and grasshoppers. The mice are going to have a positive impact on directly on the rabbits and the fox that eats it. Rabbits, mice, and snakes will have a positive impact on the hawks if, they're in, if there's an increase in their population. Mice population will have a positive impact on the frogs and owls that consume them. 
and grasshoppers will have a positive impact on the frogs and birds that consume them. And birds uh, will have a positive impact, uh, and frogs will have a positive impact on the snakes if their population was to increase. So it's just showing that one organism consumes the other. I really don't know how you would draw the pluses and minuses on this picture without showing it looking really messy. So it's more important that you just understand that all of these are playing a role on each other. So because of that, we typically see what we call a pyramid of numbers. We see a pyramid of biomass, like how many we can have because these organisms are consuming the ones below it. So notice that there's only one tree. There's a lot of mass to that tree though. So even though there's only one tree, there, there's a lot of grams of that tree. And each population above is getting a smaller and smaller amount. So typically we will see this triangle shape unless our producers is only one single tree, which we then our pyramid of numbers might show a smaller number down at the base. But what we see in our biomass, which is the amount of mass that this organism takes up, is a smaller number because as we go up a food chain or through a food web, those organisms are dependent on the ones underneath it. So, um, and it's not always efficient to get the energy from that organism considering that only 10% of the energy can be passed on typically, so we're having less and less as we go up. So notice that your arrows in a food web is going to be showing where the energy is going, okay? And so if a fox has a negative impact on the rabbit population, then it actually is really good for the grass, okay? Because your grass is being consumed by rabbits. So if the foxes are eating the rabbit, grass is ending up growing more. So all things in a food web show the direct relationships, but then also indirect relationships that go on within organisms. So now we're gonna make some predictions. If you were given the above food web, predict what would happen if the owls were taken out of the ecosystem. So I'm just gonna cross out my owl here. Take a look at the organisms that the owl eats, your frog, and your mice population, and those would increase. They would do well, okay? They're happy, so I'm gonna put little pluses. But the organisms that they eat would actually decrease. So notice that mice eat grass and they eat grasshoppers. We would end up having a decrease in those populations. And then uh, notice that we do have these other carnivores over here, which include your foxes, your hawks, and your snakes, without the owl, their population may benefit because that was one of their competitors with eating food, okay? All right, the next question, question number 11. Given the above food web, predict what would happen if the grasshoppers were taken out of the ecosystem. So now I'm gonna cross out the grasshoppers and let's see what would happen. Without grasshoppers, your grass might do better. So there might be a benefit to the grass because the grasshoppers were consuming the grass. Frog and bird populations may decrease because we don't have them anymore. So these might actually have a negative impact on them because that's one of their food sources. Um, that frog and bird population reductions might actually cause the snake population to also do poorly. And if that takes place in your hawk and owl population may also do poorly, okay? Because they have reduced prey. So this would be very negative to have one of these primary consumers, the grasshoppers be eliminated. So when people are sp spraying pesticides, they have to be mindful that yes, you may be affecting one organism, but since they're in an entire web of interconnected species, they might be affecting the entire ecosystem and in a way that they do not entirely want to affect it. So we don't want all of the species to decrease in number. We just wanted those insects to go away. All right, given the above food web in number 12, what would happen if the snakes were taken out of the ecosystem? So now I'm gonna cross out the snakes 
And if the organism underneath it, those are your frog and your bird population, they may initially increase due to the lack of predation. Um, so they don't have that predator eating them. So they actually might benefit, okay? Um, this may cause an increase in their grass population because now we have more of that available because your grasshoppers decreased because they were able to eat more and then your grass was, was in a more positive situation. All right, um, if this happened, the hawks might also decrease because that was one of their food sources, so it could be negative for them. So it's not really important that you know exactly what would happen to every single organism, but considering that all organisms are connected in some way, if there is a sudden increase or a sudden decrease in that population, it may affect the other organisms in that web, okay? So that's the goal, is that you're able to see that sort of relationship. All right, question number 13, what are some examples of the trophic levels? So typically we will draw it as a triangle and you'll have your producers here at their bottom level. These are the organisms that are undergoing photosynthesis. Then we have your primary consumers right above that. They're the ones that eat the producers, we typically call them herbivores. Then we have your secondary consumers above that. Those are typically your carnivores or omnivores because they sometimes can eat both the plants and the animals. And then we have your tertiary consumers up at the top, okay? They, do, um, they don't exist in all ecosystems, but there are some ecosystems that even have quaternary consumers. So we have, or even more than that. So as you go up a energy pyramid, it depends on the ecosystem, how many different levels there actually are. So how would we define a producer for question number 14? Their role is to produce the energy into a form that is available to themselves and other organisms. So these are your autotrophs that are doing photosynthesis. So a corn plant would be a producer because it undergoes photosynthesis and it creates the glucose, which can then be either used for itself or for the organism that eats it, the herbivores. What is a consumer? A consumer is going to need to consume, so they need to eat or obtain another organism for energy, so we call them heterotrophs, because they're going to a different place for energy. And their role in energy cycling is that the energy is going from one of the organism and being transferred to the other. So we are consumers because we eat and we cannot make our own glucose from the sun. We need to make a sandwich. So we need to make food and then get the glucose from that food that we, we obtain by eating. All right, question number 16. What is a primary consumer, a secondary consumer, and provide examples of each? A primary consumer is something that eats the producers. So they're your herbivores like deer, which eat grass or trees or plants. A secondary consumer is something that eats the primary consumers. Um, they could be typically carnivores or they could be omnivores depending on what else is in their diet. A wolf eats a deer and then that deer was a primary consumer so that would make the wolf a secondary consumer. So animals can change places and don't have to be always a secondary or a primary consumer, especially if they're omnivores because they could be on either level so a bear, for example, would never be at this lowest level because that's where the plants are. But the bear could either be here if it's eating berries or here if it's eating fish. So it could be on this level or this level, depending on what it's consuming. So it's, it's the context that's really important to figuring out where they are on that energy pyramid. So how does an organism gain energy? It does this by photosynthesis at the beginning or by eating organisms that already did photosynthesis or eating an organism that consumed an organism that consumed an organism that did photosynthesis. So the idea is that we either, the organism either had to make it using uh, the sunlight and converting CO2 and water into glucose or by eating an organism or eating something, yeah, eating an organism that is made up of glucose.
We also need food for materials to build our bodies. So we also need fat, protein, and carbohydrates in our diet. All right, question number 18. What does most of the energy the ecosystem gains go to? Most of the energy an organism takes in or makes is used for cellular respiration, or it ends up being lost in waste or in heat loss. So this is important that most of the energy that an organism takes in ends up getting lost. And so I have a picture that I'll show you again from the first video where the cow is taking in all of this plants, but then it's not digesting all of it. And then it's using it up and then a lot of heat's lost. So not all of it's used for growth. So typically what we see is that energy gets passed from the next trophic level when it's eaten and only around 10% and it could vary. So the picture I show you shows you around 25% but it's usually in a range of five to 15, depending on the organism, where 10% of the energy can be passed from one trophic level to the next. So here's that picture I was mentioning. Um, here it shows the food being consumed by the cow and notice not all of it's being used to be stored inside of the tissues. Instead, a lot of this energy is getting lost. Now this shows 25, but we have a rule of 10 typically where 10% of the energy would then be able to go from this cow into the human that's eating a hamburger, okay? So only 10% of the energy typically can go from one organism to the next. So here's a nice little visual for you, starting with the sun. The plant itself is only getting some of the energy from the sunlight, and then just being a plant you know, making those pretty flowers, attracting pollinators, growing, a lot of the energy ended up being used up. So by the time the snail that's eating it gets the energy, only 10% is being passed on from that organism, from the plant, from that sunflower to that snail. And then just being a snail and creating that, um, like that mucus that it uses to help with its movement, um, and doing cellular respiration and attracting mates and finding locations for food, all of that requires the snail to use energy. So by the time the frog eats that, only 10% of the energy goes to that frog. And the frog, ribbit, ribbit, is gonna be using energy to swim around, find mates, to you know find food. And it's going to be utilizing around 90% of the energy that by the time a frog consumes it, only 10% of that energy is going to that top level carnivore in this particular food chain, okay? So they call that the rule of 10. Notice all we did was just moved over the decimal point. So if I had these with different numbers, let's say I said, well, let me make up another number. Let's make up six, seven, three, four, five joules, okay? Then all I would do is just move over the decimal point one, okay? So I would go 0.5 joules. For, and then for this next level, I would do six, seven, three, four, five, and I'd have the decimal point here. And then I would move it one more here because you're doing 10%, okay? So you're just really moving over your decimal point, over, which makes it really easy to do versus needing to take out a calculator. All right, thank you for watching.